Welcome everyone to the fourth season, the fourth year of uh, ASC Speaker Series, Cybernetics Conversations and Salons. Our guest today is Rafael Arar. And I met, I had the opportunity to meet uh, Rafael a couple of years ago after after Raphael moved to Portland, where I am, Portland, Oregon, USA. And we've had some some wonderful uh, uh, get togethers. And so I wanted to invite, of course, encourage him to join ASC, which which he has, and invite him to um, uh, to join us in in uh, uh, one of these uh, speaker series conversations so that we could uh, learn a little bit more about his work. He has a, a, a wonderful, uh, varied uh, expertise, which Rafael is going to uh, tell us about. And um, so I won't uh, introduce any any of, of his background. Um, what I do want to say is that uh, Raphael's presentation will about 40 minutes, and I, I would like to ask you to hold off on comments, uh, verbal, uh, uh, textual comments during the the presentation, um, and then after after that we'll open it up. Um, we'll follow Raphael's uh, presentation with uh, a little bit of an interview by myself, and then uh, gradually um, everyone else. Uh, will be welcome to, to join in. Um, so, with that said, uh, Raphael, do you want to you want to get started? Yeah, absolutely. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So, hello, everyone. Um, thank you again so much for having me here today. It's it's an honor. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Rafael Arar, and I'll just start by saying that I've been fascinated by systems for a long time and have sought out opportunities to uncover transdisciplinary ways to make sense of them. So concretely, this has meant that I've often found myself in a perpetual state of intersection as an artist, a designer, a researcher, and have really found myself most at home in R&D spaces, navigating complex and ambiguous problems and so I've used tools from a hybrid background as both an artist and designer, relying upon research as a through line throughout my practice. And I attribute this fascination with systems and the dialectical approach between art and design as being the catalyst for propelling me into fascination with cybernetics. So I figure it's best to start there at that origin story um, before discussing a sampling of projects the relation to cybernetic principles and closing with a framework uh, for how I think about uh, this type of practice. Um, so my upbringing was really one of intersection, uh, particularly exploring how we interact with systems of various scales. So as a child of refugees from failed socialist uh, experiments of sorts, uh, my dad grew up under Nasserism in Egypt, my mom under Stalinism in the Soviet Union. I found myself caught between two economic ideologies, uh, socialism and capitalism. And so navigating the boundaries of a home environment and the boundaries of the outside world in the States was perhaps my first experience of the kinds of intersections that I'd be exploring much later in life. Uh, but broadly speaking, I became interested in how different worldviews and ideologies feed into one another, the positive and negative loops that arise and strengthen or shift ideology. So I grew up hearing and speaking bits of Russian, French, Arabic, and English that led to a fascination with language and by extension conversation. Direct translation of idioms from one language to another uh, exposed me to more feedback loops of understanding and misinterpretation, uh, much like cybernetics reveals about systems and their interactions. And so the interplay of language became a personal primer in the world of systemic feedback, feedback adaptation and one of the many ways that noise exists in systems. But it wasn't until diving deep into the disciplines of music composition that I came across the world of interaction design. 
sound art and electronic music exposed me to things like modular synthesizers, tangible interaction design, and the intrigue of time-based media. And uncovering works from folks like Suzanne Shiani, Alvin Lucier, and Brian Eno was perhaps my first concrete introduction into feedback, regulation, and control, not to mention just the, the sheer intrigue of complexity, of taming the complexity inherent in these synthesizers. So analogously, I developed an interest in economic systems that continuously raise questions about how systems adapt, why neoclassical economics concretized in ways that rely upon perpetual growth, and how on earth concepts like the Kuznets curve, which indicates that society must get worse before it gets better, made any sense. Um, and so I attribute this full combination of both tangible and intangible systems and the necessity to manage complexity across domains like time, scale, and geography to have uncovered a path to design, particularly design around complexity. And I stumbled into the field of interaction design in the mid-aughts as a way to channel those interests. So these new skills that I began developing as a designer became tools to augment an ongoing art practice and vice versa. And working in the tech sector made my art practice much more critical in nature. I began exploring technology-driven installation work, relying upon different interaction models. During the time, I started to see the two disciplines of art and design as being in uh, conversation with one another. Artists ask questions, designers try to answer them. And I found this to be both valid at a societal level, uh, but also at the individual. And I pursued graduate studies at the California Institute of the, uh, Institute of the Arts uh, to hone in on this dialectic and explore it as a fractal. So Claude Shannon in information theory was admittedly this first introduction into concepts inherited by cybernetic principles. And I'm grateful to my mentors at CalArts, writer Norman Klein, technologist Tom Jennings, and sound artist Mark Trail, who introduced me to Shannon and by extension Stafford Beer, the work of Roy Ascot and others and through noise, I sought to explore how it manifests in a system aesthetically and began to ask, what happens when that noise compounds? And so as I translated this theory to my work, I began distilling the art installation work based on their interaction models and developed a very simple framework to help consider and guide audience experiences. The first being interactive, where active engagement enables the work to operate. The second being responsive, the operation of the work does not depend upon deliberate action. The third being participatory, where any action taken results in the potential for experiencing and sensing feedback. And so these categories became meta-organizing principles for how the works I created at the time engaged in feedback, feedback adaptation, and homeostatic principles. And this was one of the ways in, I, in which I explored how a design process can inform an aesthetic process and vice versa as well as the kind of emergent effects, both desirable and undesirable, that arise from the prevalence of noise. And so I explored these works focused first on the visceral, like the sound installation with a ping pong table that was instrumented with a variety of sensors. Uh, very transparent forms of feedback loop in sound, it can sound over time. And as a composer, I was responsible for governing the feedback to ensure some form of homeostasis is achieved. And so this work, of course, is directly inspired by artists like Brian Eno and Texas artists like John Jim Pipe. The work also got more conceptual as I learned about critical and secular design practices championed by Anthony Dunn and Joanna Raby. The C plus minus pendulum is a case in point. And in it, I explore the significance of physical location giving it an increasingly remote environment. The piece operates using the certain mechanics of the physical pendulum, a mechanism created in the 19th century to demonstrate the physical properties. From collective user input, I asked participants where they wanted to be in the world through a mobile web application that took a running average of the latitude and longitude points that end up operating this motor chain in this seven foot tall structure. Those data points orient the pendulum to collect the desired location seeking to show that our world is not flat or oblong or even round. It's actually malleable and democratic in the same here. And so the piece was shown at the International Symposium of Electronic Art in both Dubai and LA via live stream uh, as a bit of an homage to the telekinetic work of the 
So in 2014, I found a niche in the R&D departments of many organizations and haven't looked back. And zooming out, there's an interplay that I've sought to explore with uh, that with or within organizations relying upon art and speculative design practice coupled with the more targeted design work that we're doing. This meta feedback loop is one that I'll trace in three chapters, each focusing on a bigger systemic space, starting with enterprise, then education, and economics. And so just a quick disclaimer that I may use we to describe these efforts since some of the work occurred in team environments, but I want to acknowledge that these are my own observations and personal interpretations of what evolved. So after stint working with Apple on enterprise use cases for their new hardware, like the watch and the iPad Pro, I embedded myself within IBM research. And at the time, the lab was focused on developing new use cases and new forms of machine learning uh, and their user-facing manifestations. So toolkits like sentiment analysis and conversational user interfaces were rapidly being developed and sold to customers. And as I dug deeper into this work, it appeared to me that the quote, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, actually stood in the way of a rigorous investigation of the technologies and some of the glaring gaps in approach. So to ask questions and engage other researchers in a critical look at these toolkit, toolkits, I began what I call an intra-organizational art-based research and design practice. And so the AI space introduced me to one of the new AI services IBM was putting out, Emotion Detection. And so this toolkit could take natural language in text form and uh, actually output mathematical data corresponding to vectors of the most primitive emotions, anger, joy, sadness, fear, and disgust. And IBM ended up selling this service to marketers who were looking to speed up uh, the analysis of customer review data. And so seeing this made me curious and I wondered how we could take something so qualitative and convert it into something quantitative. And there's of course a lot of bias and error even with just these primitive emotions. And so I began to wonder about emotions that humans have a hard time understanding ourselves. And I thought of the most complex one I could think of at the time, nostalgia, and formulated an applied research project around it. So this inquiry began by asking folks internally about the service, data scientists, anthropologists, and ethicists. And I also reached out to two professors at the University of Southampton who have devoted their lives to studying nostalgia. They gave me access to their data where they had manually coded texts uh, and passages as either nostalgic or ordinary. And so this data combined with the guidance of some very experienced machine learning researchers pointed me in the right direction for how to train a model based on a motion detection service that could learn the right mix of primitive emotions that corresponded to a nostalgic entry. And the, this became the brains of the installation that you see here and what I called a nostalgia index. So the piece premiered as part of the first art exhibition at SLAC, the Particle Accelerator Laboratory in the Bay Area. And I augmented the mechanics of the installation to include a physical metaphor, these light-based hourglass sculptures. So the interactive flow looks something like this. A participant shares a memory. The system outputs a nostalgia score from one to 100, showing participants a breakdown of how it got there. It digitally presents this information, but also physically through a rosier hue of these sculptures uh, for stronger nostalgia scores, as well as a slower speed of the motor uh, that rotates an hourglass to prolong the moment. Um, so these sculptures, three sculptures and other data then present themselves like historic nostalgia scores throughout the whole exhibition history and predictive nostalgia scores based on the system's learning of others' input, which also accounted for observers during their entry. And so what was learned? Well, first, the intent was not to create an accurate representation of a machine understanding of nostalgia. Although I like to think that we, maybe we got close, um, but rather this poetic interpretation raised awareness of the slippery nature of a qualitative quantitative translation. See, sometimes the nostalgia for score felt accurate and other times it felt pretty far out. And while entertaining, the piece highlighted one, the challenges of generating computational intelligence of complex emotions, and two, the dangers and mishaps of its reliance. And so while sharing the installation with the general public was of course gratifying, the, the biggest takeaway actually arose when internal researchers began to evolve their methods and even pursue additional projects around robust ethical lenses centered on these types of complex inquiries. So working on how computers learn reignited a passion for education. Uh, teaching had been and has been a core part of my life. Um, my father was a math teacher 
And my parents taught me that education is the kind of ticket to self-improvement and what I later realized to be neoliberal success. And coupled with uh, a newfound corporate sector disillusionment, I jumped into the education space inspired by the dialectical approach espoused by radical educator Paulo Freire. And the shift was also fueled by a constant desire to get to core systems, root causes, and continuously operate at a higher order leverage point for systems change. So I ended up meeting the design team at Khan Academy, a nonprofit whose mission is to provide a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. And they were hiring as part of their internal R&D team. And while that group was eventually disbanded, I augmented the work I was doing leading design on the core platform with a more discursive design practice. And so at Khan Academy, we were focused on questions like how might we cultivate intrinsic motivation in learners? And what kind of reward systems are conducive to fostering a love of learning? And this led to a lot of exploration and some new products centered on on-screen interaction. And so mediated by these interfaces, I be increasingly felt as though the experiences we were creating were purely transactional. And in Freire's Pedagogy the Press, he actually critiques traditional education. And one of his claims is that it can be considered the banking model of education because it's transactional in nature and equates learners as piggy banks, wherein teachers deposit bits of knowledge to facilitate learning. And instead, he argued in favor of a pedagogical model that facilitated criti critical dialogue in order to break down power dynamics. And so I thought, what if education actually did continue forward in a purely transactional way? And what if we literally interpreted, Fer interpreted Ferry's notion of the banking model of education? And so I created this piece of speculative design that envisions a future wherein all learners on Khan Academy experience learning as a rote ATM transaction. There's no teacher involvement, no classroom collaboration, but rather a learner does an exercise and gets a little receipt for their efforts through a simple receipt printer attached to their laptop. And so this is the type of speculative design that envisions a future we don't want. Uh, and I wanna stress that it's antithetical to the core values at Khan Academy. That said, the piece ended up serving as a counterbalance to the team's design efforts. Um, the speculative design of this sort can in effect serve as a lens of a point of, and a point of reflection to actually compare against the product roadmap. So similar to nostalgia, while the piece was presented and shared externally, the greatest impact arose from its internal perceptions, uh, particularly amongst the design team. See, as we were embarking on a three-year design visions, it served as a compass to question things like, are we moving toward or away from this dystopian vision presented in these designs? Is this a vision that democratizes technology and services leveling the playing field? So the pandemic was a strong inflection point for me and many of us, um, and working in education at a time when learners were at home reinforced the, the notion that the learners at Khan Academy that I was hoping to reach were actually the ones who didn't have internet access and perhaps more importantly, a lack of social support networks to cultivate learning. And so I wanted to continue focusing more on root causes. And so this desire to dig deeper coincided with what has been a lifelong inquiry into political economy. And it was around this time that I got introduced to an organization centered on exploring alternative economics and governance systems. So One Project is an organization whose mission is to support the global transition to a more equitable, ecological, and effective uh, system of economics and governance. And around the time of our first conversations, the organization was very much in the state of diagnosis. What isn't working in capitalism and why? What can be course corrected? And so these conversations helped evolve and propel two projects centered on climate justice and capitalism more broadly. The first, uh, Food Carbon Footprint Index, is a piece of participatory art that imagines a late capitalist dystopian future where individuals are actually held personally responsible for the climate crisis. So participants each receive a daily allotment of 100 CO2 points and are asked to log their meal choices via a web application. And so meals with a higher carbon footprint require more CO2 points and vice versa. And participants are then assessed based on their food choices and rank displayed on a public leaderboard. And so those who exceed their daily carbon allotments are, are fined and subject to public shame. 
And so the piece seeks to complicate our relationship with the power of individual choice in the face of a looming global environmental devastation. When capitalism requires that the individual bear the burden of responsibility in making smart moral decisions with this low burning hope of a share in prosperity, who benefits and who loses? Do these efforts actually encourage self-development for the collective good or is there another way forward? And with the future of our species hanging in the balance, what is the be best way forward? Um, and so the project was shown at Arizona State University's Emerge Festival, as well as the Participatory Design Conference. And I'm really grateful that it did create this space in the room where it was able to, we were able to have a lot of these conversations that actually fed back directly into uh, the inception of this next piece. Uh, called an ecological oracle, um, which coincided with the 2021 IPCC report that described the likelihood of a one and a half degree Celsius increase in global temperatures by 2013 to uh, by 2030. And this report uh, dovetailed with glimpses of what a greener urban landscape might look like uh, in light of a lot of us sheltering in place. And so these benefits in nature, while temporary, uh, served as a point of inquiry. Climate change is of course a wicked problem and in that respect has nebulous boundaries and no clear black and white answers. It's a hyper object that has become deeply politicized and entangled with other global problems like equity, further exacerbating its effects. However, all of this led to a few fundamental questions. Uh, could we proliferate some of the positive environmental changes at the start of the pandemic and would it make a difference in our efforts to fight climate change? And in certain parts of the world, we've seen individuals take responsibility for what they believe to be their part, uh, while others feel like individual attempts are futile or just non-existent. Um, so will we remain mired in what Mark Fisher calls capitalist realism, lacking creativity and unable to look beyond the assumption of individual responsibility? And so these questions catalyze the creation of an ecological oracle, a time-based installation that turns the gallery into a microcosm of the social dynamics at play in light of our impending climate catastrophe. So the work hinges on a sculptural component consisting of two beakers that serve as a metaphor for the levels of ice on, a planet, on the planet. The beaker on the left begins full of water representing the available water supply, while the beaker on the right uh, begins empty and represents the glacial melt. And nested within that empty beaker is a smaller beaker of red dyed liquid which represents the conglomerate tipping points of climate change. And so there's a pump between these two beakers that transfers water from one to another based on the social dynamics of the spatial environment. So as participants enter the space, the system monitors the number of individuals in the installation's vicinity, serving as a proxy for urbanization. It also monitors total audible volume input uh, that serves as a proxy for noise pollution. So these inputs are calibrated at the start of an exhibition of the exhibition so that deviations from what's calibrated uh, affect the system accordingly. So as urbanization and noise pollution values exceed calibrated limits, water flows from the reservoir beaker to the milk beaker and vice versa. And so the rate and amount of flow uh, correspond to the magnitude of deviations. And so once the volume of water in that empty, once empty beaker exceeds its threshold, the installation reaches its tipping point and enters a new undesirable regime shift. And the contents of the tipping point beaker now mix with the water. And so any collective effort by participants in the space to combat the effects of it are thwarted. Um, participants have now entered uh, and reached the point of no return. And so there's a multimedia visualization that accompanies the physical component of this installation. On the left side, you see the calibrated states and on the right side, you see the real-time data. And these effects end up manifesting in the distortion of the right half of the blue marble as it progressively degrades into a pixelated desaturated morass. And when the tipping point happens, this is the, the visualization that you see. And so there's also a doomsday clock of sorts that had a predictive uh, analysis of when the tipping point might be hit given the, the conditions that had transpired in the space. So here's a causal loop of the diagram of the interaction model that I just outlined. Um, and as the piece came to fruition and was exhibited at the Science Gallery Detroit, uh, which is now the Michigan State University Museum, 
it led to more emerging questions. Um, can participants self-organize in the short and long term uh, to not overwhelm the system? How much do individual changes affect the greater whole? What types of collaborations or conflicts will ensue as participants attempt to understand how various inputs affect the system? And will participants try to account for future generations to allow them to experience the system? So these questions are not unique to the microcosmic experience of this work. Uh, the planet and its constituent parts need to address these same questions uh, as we try and mitigate the deleterious effects of climate change. So sharing these two works back at one project served as helpful framing and context for not just my own inquiry, but my growing teams in the next phase of this organization, one I call speculation. At one project, I've been leading a team that's exploring the kind of socio-technical infrastructure that can enable alternatives to capitalism to root and flourish. Not only do we want to build off these skeletal tensions of the political economy today, like things like individual versus collective, present versus future outlined in the previous projects, but from a socio-technical standpoint, we also wanna be building off the massive technological advances that have enabled unprecedented capabilities and possibilities in political economy and collective intelligence, especially since any other large scale alternative to capitalism like central planning has been attempted. So I see the organization and my team as essentially a long-term R&D project and really a container for the gamut of work that I've shared with you thus far in this dialectical approach between art and design. So before I move on to a framework for how we can think about approaching this type of work, I wanna describe some of the organization's speculative research to date. So this effort of course begins with learning from the past and I'm sure everyone here is already familiar with the iconic and almost spiritual project of Cybersyn and to not pull inspiration from it would be a massive oversight. We're also interested in some of the smaller local and regional experiments underway and have been mapping their models and visions like the work with Cooperation Jackson, a grassroots initiative in Jackson, Mississippi, focused on building economic democracy through cooperative enterprise. The Boston Ujima Project, who created and operate the first democratically run investment firm. Rojava, a self-governing region in northern Syria, championing direct democracy, gender equality, and ecological sustainability, upholding the principles of democratic confederalism, and many other communities, organizations, and networks like them. Then there are the formal economic models that have yet to have been realized, particularly around democratic economic planning. And as a designer, I found it essential to make sense of them and understand their nuances. So this has led to its own speculative effort of first diagramming the mechanics. So here's participatory economics, a model from Robin Honnell and Michael Alpert, which imagines an economic system with no markets, but rather a robust annual planning process. Negotiated coordination, another model for democratic economic planning from Pat Devine and Fikret Adaman. Towards a new socialism, a model for what's been called cyber communism for, from Paul Cockshot and Alan Contrell. And to build off those diagrams, my team and I have even explored the kinds of software that might support the realization, like this app concept for planning and participatory economics. I like to think of it as something like TurboTax meets Amazon. Imagine doing a, a bulk shop once a year, perhaps. <laughs> And honestly, I found all of this research inspiring, past, present, and future. And yes, we can, and we absolutely should spend hours, days, and years critiquing this, uh, these models and these ideas. But frankly, I'm just delighted that they exist and that we have and have had a set of bright minds iterating upon such deep, complex questions, navigating spaces of theory and practice. And in doing this research, the intent is not to create one monolithic economic system that can transition the masses. See, I believe much like many others that this economic system, that kind of economic system might, must evolve through a procedural process rooted in the values of economic democracy. But to build upon the quote from the Zapatistas, 
the organization is interested in co-creating the kind of infrastructure that can help realize a world where many worlds fit. How might we enable the experimentation, learning, and sharing of tools, tactics, and strategies to cultivate entirely new forms of coordination to emerge? So where is this research taking us? Uh, well, the organization is gearing up to actively begin co-designing with communities and networks globally. And this approach involves bringing people, knowledge, and resources together to design a people's infrastructure, tools and systems that help us work and live more harmoniously for the benefit of all. And to do this, I've been building upon the existing schools of practice in participatory design and mutual learning, which seek to democratize capital D design practice. And this participatory design approach is infused with the bridging of two key, key polarities, vision and transition in microeconomics and macroeconomics. So with the first polarity, the idea is to start with a vision, trial it or a portion of it, and then rework it based on what's been learned. And I've sought inspiration from a practice in strategic foresight known as backcasting, where one envisions a future state and then works backward to identify the steps necessary to achieve it. Um, and the approach that I've employed is a slight tweak, and my team and I call it iterative backcasting. And the idea is to imagine a desirable future state with just enough fidelity to take a transitionary step toward it, which serves as a minimum viable experiment with enough criteria to learn from its outcome and adjust the vision accordingly. And we anticipate doing this kind of back and forth between vision and transition to help cut the distance between the transition phases and a continuously updated future state. On the economic side, I believe that what happens at the microeconomic layer should inform the macroeconomic layer and vice versa. A scalable platform needs the ability to operate at varying levels of fidelity from individual to individual, community to community, and large network to network. And this is precisely why it's inspiring to look at the efforts in grassroots communities experimenting with uh, economic relations that uh, differ from the status quo. We're also interested in how they might scale, including the kinds of phase shifts that occur when a community moves beyond Dunbar number. See, there are certain practices and economic relations that function well in small numbers when you personally know who you're buying bread from. But when one becomes disconnected and perhaps alienated from the means of production, things get complicated and difficult to manage. And as for the inverse, there are global challenges that span borders like carbon emissions and affect communities at the local level. So I want us to be considering the interplay between these scale layers and how one can inform the other. So where is all this research and framing led to? Um, well, I've taken a page from the product design toolkit and have been stewarding and calling on others to help shape a design specification or a spec for the kinds of goals and requirements economic and governance systems might strive for. Things like people over profit, the regeneration of nature, resilience, and so on. And the spec is an iterative document that is continuously shaped by this whole ecosystem of actors and evolves based on the collective pulse of that very ecosystem. For the time being, it's helped the team iterate on speculative visions for how different economic relations could take shape, the old practices that have historically been unable to scale to the entirely new ones that are now possible. And as one project evolves, the next phase will be deep co-creation experimentation with communities and networks globally. And the organization is still very much in its early days. So these are just a couple of threads that are being pulled on. And as an organization grounded in adaptive learning, I'm confident that much of this material that I've shared with you will be obsolete as we continue to engage and learn more in the field. All right, so sharing this journey and the insights gathered might spark a question, how might organizations, groups of people embed such transdisciplinary practices? So over the years, I've been slowly chipping away at a broader framework for applying this kind of intra-organizational R&D work. And I wanna share some of that early work with you all. So it's been a helpful guiding framework for how I think about my own work over the past decade. So I call it the transdisciplinary R&D integration framework, and it begins with purpose identification, really asking the question, why integrate transdisciplinary practices into R&D? 
And there are three aspects of this, one of which is strategic insight. Um, I believe this type of work enhances organizational perspectives through novel thinking methods. Um, the second being value creation. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a set of practices that uh, are intended to provide substantial contribution over surface level appeals. And third is deep dive analyses. It's intended to look at root causes as opposed to symptoms of them. Now we might ask what kinds of tools or environments are necessary for effective in integration? And there are three that I've identified, one of which is the, the importance of developing a shared vocabulary, um, a glossary, a database of terms or concepts, especially when terms may dif differ from discipline to discipline. The second is around culture and shifting culture. This kind of transdisciplinary work requires egolessness, humility, desire, the comfort of feeling like an ongoing novice. Um, and then the third is interdisciplinary recruitment. It's much easier uh, to start with interdisciplinary teams to start or inter interdisciplinary individuals as opposed to deep specialists. Now we might think about the kinds of infrastructure um, and how those types of uh, aspects might create an environment conducive to transdisciplinary work. And the first is obviously time. Uh, this work requires a lot of time and designating, designating specific time slots for deep dives, for brainstorming and collaboration, in general, more time than one thinks. Uh, the second are what I've been calling idea labs, uh, which are physical or virtual spaces dedicated to the free exploration of these kinds of ideas, um, with the disclaimer that this type of work, especially creative work, is much easier co-located in uh, physical proximity. And the third, um, I've described this in some of the projects uh, outlined previously, was, is just showcase platforms uh, and internal showcase platforms. Uh, so internal portals or platforms, what I call intra-galleries, where this work can be shared internally, exhibited, reviewed, and reflected upon. Now we get into methodology and the systematic approach, what kinds of methods uh, to be employed to ensure a systematic implementation. And there are four lenses to this, really. The first being audience analysis. Uh, is this a project or work that's intended for internal improvements or external uh, showcases or both? The second is around entity involvement. Uh, what, what kinds of aspects comprise the work itself? Are they human-centered, tech-centered, uh, a hybrid human of human and non-human? The third is being time frame allocation. What timeline are we looking at? Is this something that is intended to affect short term strategy or long term strategy? And then the fourth is orientation. Is this a project that is primarily research uh, heavy or, or application focused or a hybrid? Now we get into feedback mechanisms. How does one measure, analyze, and iterate based on the outcomes and feedback? Um, well, there's a variety of existing tools already, uh, feedback collection tools. We can look to ethno methodology for this and design research, surveys, face to face reviews, or digital feedback platforms. Feedback, of course, is bi directional, uh, it's not unidirectional. So, having analysis workshops where you have sessions to discuss the feedback, identify areas of improvement, and then be able to integrate them into an iterative development cycle. Uh, scheduling revisions, refinements based on feedback. Uh, software teams do this well, in, especially for those that employ agile methodologies. And then at this kind of meta level, um, continuous learning and evolution, how does an organization ensure that it's continuously updating its transdisciplinary practices? And the first is really around regular training. Uh, engaging, creating workshops or courses on some of the emerging interdisciplinary practices as, as new disciplines are being um, spawned. How are we uh, informing the rest of the organization around this? The second, I've outlined this with a couple projects I shared, collaboration with external entities. How, how can an organization partner with universities, think tanks, or other organizations uh, to continuously stay updated and uh, not become too siloed within itself? And the third is more desk research and trend analysis of dedicating teams or efforts uh, to analyze global trends, 
of what else might be analogous in the space of transdisciplinary R&D. So of course, this framework is not a one size fits all solution. It's just a guideline based on shared experiences and learning. Um, and I believe it's essential to adapt and iterate based on the unique needs and challenges of any respective organization, group of people, collective, so on and so forth. So there might be another question uh, some of you may be asking if you're an artist or a speculative designer, why, why even bother? Uh, wouldn't it be easier to do this work on your own or through a more traditional gallery or museum route or even an artist in residence program? And my takeaway is that artists and speculative designers provide critical lenses into any organization's short-term and long-term strategy. Whereas most artists in residence programs serve marketing goals, uh, embedding this thinking within serves as connective tissue to connect seemingly disparate disciplines and provide a healthy dose of being able to zoom in and zoom out. And so to close and to put it simply, this work helps shift mindsets within an organization. It's work that focuses on genuine value and not just aesthetic appeal. And it's centered on diving deep into the foundational elements and asking why. And in the spirit of cybernetics, all this work has been about feedback loops. The systems and projects I've shared with you have operated in my own personal feedback loop in the relation to this dialectic of art and design. And my parting words are that this type of practice has an active and even normative role in dis design more broadly in the design of new systems. Art and critical design practices are not just passive forms of critique, but rather operate in this broader conversation of systems change. See, the crux of transdisciplinary practice is to transcend disciplines to tap into a form of collective intelligence, which I believe is the future a future where we embrace a plurality of approaches, foster a culture of continuous learning, and relentlessly push the boundaries of what's possible. Thank you all very much for your time. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much. Brilliant, brilliant. At this point, I, I want to um, uh, welcome anyone who wants to uh, engage in, in the chat thread to uh, join in. I've, I've started by collecting some some links there that I've gathered from Raphael's presentation. And we're going to continue with um, uh, a little bit of conversation with Raphael and myself. and. Um, uh, we'll do that for a little bit, and then uh, in due time, welcome everyone else to, to join in. So, Raphael, I love the um, kind of interplay that you describe between your your day jobs, your various day jobs, and then your uh, your art art practice. Um, you know, in the so I want to kind of explore this back and forth. One is that. In describing how your day jobs have influenced the art pieces um, that that you've uh, shown as examples, often, and and this is something that I often see in in um, in contemporary art, digital art, that there's an emphasis on on um, uh, uh, visualization or um, uh, impact mitigation or dystopias. And so I wonder, you know, have the more uh, purposeful, um, uh, you know, work that you're doing in, has that, you know, especially one project, has that, how has that influenced your, your artwork? And then going the other way, um, could you uh, talk a little bit more about how your, your colleagues in, in your day job see, um, see the artwork and how they respond to it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yes, the my orientation has in fact shifted over the years and, and by nature of the organizations that I've been part of, but also by, by nature of the discipline of, I would say, speculative design and critical art practices. Um, I think many, many folks might agree that it, it almost feels often like the current day is more and more approaching dystopia. Uh, and so when um, a lot of these practices began, especially um, 
I would say, given that speculative design is a relatively new field, it was centered on creating these kind of this dystopian outlooks of like, if we continue with this current trajectory, um, this is what happens. And I don't know that we need that reminder anymore. Um, <laughs> so that's that's my own personal interpretation. And I understand why um, there's there's still a lot of value placed in it. And, and also from a from a design standpoint, it's and an, and an art standpoint, it's it's much easier to critique than to create. Um, and so if you if you try and paint a, a normative picture of uh, where we might want to go, um, something that is positive, it's it's easy to dismiss it as utopian. It's easy to dismiss it as naive. Um, however, I, I believe that those types of visions are essential. Um, uh, you know, in the spirit of, of creating discursive artifacts of just thinking about like what types of these projects can can actually foster and cultivate. Uh, the kinds of conversations that we want to be having. I'd much rather have conversations centered around um, proactive ideas of, of the types of um, uh, futures that we might want to see as opposed to things that might be bad that they happen. Um, so my work is actually starting to shift a little bit more and has shifted in, in, in regard to this particular um, focus. I'd say a lot of the participatory work is now centered on, is moving in directions of either centering um, new ways of creating research, of actually asking like, how do people respond in this kind of environment? Is this something, and learning from that and being able to feed that back into another project or the design work that I've been doing. Um, and also centered more on, um, trying to be inspired and and expose myself to more of the kinds of almost solar punk if you will uh futures of of what of what we what we'd like to see um so that's that's the next phase i would say and then with respect to um the interpretation from folks within i mean that's been that's been one of the main reasons why i felt like this work is so essential um when i started i was just you know it was really just kind of like, this would be a fun thing to do. And then of course, orienting around an external gallery or a museum show. Um, and that really shifted very early on for me, especially when I was at IBM Research and seeing uh, the excitement from data scientists who were like, oh my gosh, uh, I hadn't thought that this is so narrow. It's, it's kind of like so focused on the technical uh, task at hand and not being able to really, or not choosing to zoom out and ask the bigger why. And so um, I've been really pleased at how it's been met uh, within the organizations I've been part of, um, you know, starting with IBM Research, Khan Academy, certainly at One Project, uh, it's a way of engaging others in, in really great conversations and critical dialogue. Uh, and it's something that I believe that um, I would like to see more, more individuals take on. Yeah, thanks so much. I, you know, next, I also want to ask you about your diagram. You know, this is uh, a practice that, uh, that I, that I also really enjoy, um, you know, looking at, at projects and thinking about what, what, uh, what is going on here? How might we, uh, document it, um, visually? And, you know, so I'm thinking about the three diagrams that you showed of uh, participatory economics and the negotiated co coordination towards the socialist system. And, you know, I noticed that all three diagrams take the form of concept maps, you know, which is something that I've arrived at as well. The, the use of that type of concept map technique instead of um, causal loop diagrams or something else for, for illustrating uh, flows among entities and flows in an economy. And, um, so I just wanted to, to ask you, um, did, did those three projects have that type of diagram or is that something that you created for them? And then when you showed them or if you showed them the, the diagrams, how did they react to what you were showing them? Yeah, um, so those three diagrams in particular were directly building off of a wonderful short paper by a couple researchers in Ottawa, um, one of whom is Simone Tremblay-Pepin. And so 
I was building off of the existing work that he and his, uh, he actually has a laboratory uh, around post-capitalist futures uh, at a university there. Um, and so um, I like the concept mapping approach uh, though, and I stuck with it mostly because um, in these macroeconomic models, they there are so many different entities. And so showing the kind of concept map from just the pure planning standpoint of just showing how planning operates is a, a nice way to distill them. Um, and so um, with these particular diagrams, you know, I did give, uh, so Robin Honnell, of course, lives in Portland, um, met with him a handful of times. I gave him one of these prints. <laughs> um, these are all risograph prints. Um, I think in general, he's, uh, he, he received it warmly because I think for him and a lot of folks, um, this is such a niche space that any exposure is good exposure. <laughs> so there, there really wasn't a lot of like critique or uh, critical dialogue around it. You know, I, I know for, for example, like participatory economics, there's, there's a whole working group and um, there's a, there's a, there's a person who's working on a video game that is based off of participatory economics. So I think Robin is is in general like very supportive of anybody taking this and, and running with it. Um, I haven't shown this to Pat Devine um, or um, you know, Paul Cockshot or Alan Cottrell or Fikrit Adaman. Um, I haven't been in conversation with them, but certainly that might be the next step. And you know what I'd love to see more of is actually building off of these models. Is this one thing to to see them in two dimensional form and diagram them out? Um, but I actually would love to see more simulations of them to almost show, um, you know, how do they do they theoretically work out? What are some of the trade offs and back and forth? And these these are the kinds of conversations I'd be interested in having. I think visualizing is one step toward getting there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Another conversation that we've had around um, these types of diagrams is that, you know, each of the three examples that that you showed might be considered a, a, a type of planning. Um, and we, we've talked about this kind of interplay between um, design and what emerges from our designs or sometimes called organization and self-organization. And um, you know, one of, so in counterpart to these types of planning approaches or in complement, um, you know, we've both been interested in, uh, the design of, uh, of currency and, um, and how, um, currency design, um, can perhaps allow for, um, greater self-organization than, uh, these types of, of planning approaches. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, how that's informed your your work at at one project and um, and where that's going? Yeah, so I'll start by saying that there are of course many threads that one project is pulling on, and and I don't know that we have you know an organizational stance on the role of currencies or not, but certain things that I am interested in currencies in particular versus these these types of macroeconomic models. Um, are the, especially when we think about technology, are the opportunities uh, to hold entirely new theories of value? Um, so things that are not just fiat currency. So imagine having uh, some denomination of value that corresponds to time. You know, time banking is something that a lot of uh, communities are experimenting with. Um, if you're an orthodox Marxist, that might be the kind of everything is labor time and we should be having time tokens and one hour of babysitting is the equivalent of one hour of carpentry and so on and so forth. Um, I think these are interesting threads to pull on. Uh, and I think there, there's the intersection there, of course, with like you get into aspects of mutual credit systems and what's now possible with exchange that doesn't involve capital. It doesn't involve um, buying something for more to get buying something to get more money in return, right? Um, and so they, I see that as being a potential. I don't know that it is, my own feeling is that I don't believe that it is a, um, it's the be all end all. Um, I think there's a combination of course of political um, and 
kind of more more of the political as well as this the you both need the quantitative and the qualitative you still need the kind of deliberation that will happen in, in large groups of setting and, and the, all of this won't be solved with just currency alone um so this it's a balancing act it's a component um there are of course many aspects that we should be looking into yeah so i i would like to open up uh, to anyone who would like to join in with a, a comment or, or question for uh, for Raphael. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Howard. Um, that was a marvelous, really wonderful, clear and concise presentation. I, and I really like your work. Um, I have two questions. Um, you, so, the, the connection to cybernetics was made very clear and explicit. You introduced Freire and talk, spoke a little bit about your pedagogical approach using the we, and we got an insights into some of your projects uh, that you've done. And in the, so one question is how do the students, the learners, get involved and contribute and are being able to steer the project in a desired direction using the feedback and these iterations. Uh, and the, the next question is, is that maybe a tall order, yeah? How can we leave the gallery and the lab behind and actually move out into real life? We, we know we need time for that. You already mentioned that, yeah? Meadows writes, I think you need three or four or five years, something like that, to actually see the effects. So what do you think about that? Yeah, um, I love these questions. Um, the first one is really around um, the kind of feedback from participants, I would say, more broadly. Um, so, of course, a variety of different practices and projects. And, you know, with education, it's there's... I'll talk about the art projects themselves as opposed to the design work itself, because Khan Academy has a whole vehicle for collecting input from learners. Um, with the design projects themselves, there's, there's, um, you know, it's, it's much more of a, it has been much more of a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a um, case by case basis. Some of the installations have that by nature of the actual project itself, where I'm collecting input, there's a database, I can actually hear and under learn and understand what's happening. And that was the case with nostalgia, I was hearing these, these inputs, and then there wasn't an, a more of the feedback loop that I would have wanted to have, whereas like I'm collecting this input and then I wanna actually, so I actually end up sharing that input out. There was a website that was created where everybody could see everyone else's input in text. Um, so some of them have it by virtue of that. Um, the other ones are a little bit more, uh, less uh, formalized. So with Food Carbon Footprint Index, for example, the conversations were happening in real time. And so by virtue of me just being there, I was able to collect an input and inform the next round of thinking or the next project iteration. Um, you know, many of these are, some of these projects have been self-funded, some have been funded by organizations. So there's always the challenge of, ensuring like can we do an iterative cycle or are we sunsetting the project um but certainly feedback is something that i am i'm consistently thinking more about and participation more broadly and and having more of those loops uh at play uh through the context of, of one particular piece now your second question is uh is a very exciting one um and and an important one i would like to think um one of which is, you know, there's a whole avenue of activist art. Um, some of it is um, very transparent, some of it's subtle. Um, one could think of ways of mobilizing uh, individuals after showing a piece, for example. Um, these are certain things that I've started to do in terms of, especially if there's a project website um, or certain pieces that I have I usually, you know, there's a lot of work that I haven't shown, uh, but there are other pieces where I'll I'll put a QR code next to the actual description of the work. And that will send individuals to a page where they can not only read more about the, the actual work itself, um, 
but point them to areas where there's petitions or public action forums or things like that. So, so actually exposing uh, participants to various avenues to get them out of the space. So the, the gallery becomes a space where they're exposed to the work and then having avenues where they can actually delve into after that. Um, so that's something that I've experimented with here. Uh, I've done that pretty recently. I had a show in, here in a gallery space in Portland and was doing more of that. That's something I'd like to continue doing more of and thinking more about that. And also uh, including um, less conventional spaces to show the work itself. So, I mean, I've talked a lot about internal showcases, these intra galleries, as I call them. And I think there's a lot to pull on from the, the whole subset of public art and what does public art mean and how are we, you know, it, it's not just uh, getting people out of the gallery space. It's also reaching an entirely new audience. That's the other thing because there's, is a very small percentage of the population that will go to a gallery or a museum, at least in uh, maybe uh, less so in uh, parts outside of the U.S. But the U.S. is very, very small. Uh, it's less part of it's less of the culture, I would say. Um, so thinking more about how are we actually uh, nudging people in those directions. Thanks. Michael, I'm thinking about uh, your writings on education um, and uh, uh, thoughts about uh, Raphael's response and, and how it relates to your own thinking. Yeah, that, that, uh, that's why I'm most curious about it because I'm not really, so for me, it was important to learn to not be totally in control of of the learning process, what we are, what we are doing, um, and the big insight was. So I have had the feeling for for years I was banging against against uh, immovable walls in a sense, yeah. But I realized over time that there was an influence, and in the end, the students, as I wrote in in some papers, the students came back to me and said provide some structure yeah students need structure and uh, and i said no structure is going to destroy everything structure is an emergent phenomenon yeah and uh, and i thought you know what we i'm just trying this let's try structure and this was suddenly uh, the solution for me yeah and mm -hmm. within this framework that we created together that i created together with the students suddenly um very and giving and and giving off control as well and involving the students more and giving them roles like like uh, the timekeeping and helping with the agenda and moderating and i withdraw myself a little bit in the background and the students get the feeling that they run the course and and also um the goals are, of course, described in the course outline, what they should be able to, to the skills and knowledge that they should have acquired by the end of the semester or so. But at the same time, uh, how we do this is not prescribed. This is open for me. And so we have been involving, or this has been an evolving system uh, over time, over, over the last semesters, and it's spread out. So the tool sets they learn if we go, so I live in former Eastern Germany in a small town at the periphery of Berlin, you could say Berlin is close, but not too close. So rents are still cheap. And it's very easy for the example to the student, for the students to go to some, to ask some house owners of empty vacant shops and say, can we have your shop here for six months over the summer? We would like to do some exhibitions there. It might also be easy in Detroit, yeah? Yeah. And so, so it's so it's it's impossible now in Berlin. It used to be twenty five years ago in Berlin. This was possible as well. And now suddenly, this the students are totally motivated because it is something that they do for themselves, intrinsically motivated in town, making small exhibitions and of course some parties and so on. But also invite. Uh, pupils from schools and neighbors and everyone in to participate and suddenly this over the past of, of the, the past two three years really evolved its own dynamics mm -hmm. and that's very interesting what is what are the results what what's 
So if we look back, the students have been making books, uh, writing books about their experiences, yeah, and inviting others to replicate them at their own universities and so on. Um, then they usually, perhaps like Detroit, Dessau is a transition place where students come, they do their degree, they leave. Mm -hmm. And so the town has been shrinking over the past 20, 10, 20, 30 years. And we, of course, want the young students to stay and, and yeah, find, find, a, find make, make their home here. And this is also, this has contributing to that. So mm -hmm. some students have been leaving and they also do their master's somewhere else, but then suddenly they're coming back because they had a really good time here and they really have uh, begun to understand and love the culture that we created mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. collaboration and respect and feedback all the time and and learning how to to have discussions and in, in, in create a safe space. Yeah, I mean, what, what you've been just saying uh, has me thinking a lot about um, kind of like this, the skeletal, what is the skeletal structure for, for self-replication, right? So when you were describing, like, I didn't have any constraints or no structure whatsoever, um, you know, one of the things that I like to think about is like, what, what is the kernel, right? What is the the seed of something that uh, that's all you need to put out there? Almost like the the equivalent of the DNA, right? It's it's self replicating after that, um, and that that requires and takes time to evolve, right? Um, you have this this kernel of DNA or a language, for example, an alphabet, um, these types of things, and then thinking about what is the most minimal, and how do you continue to kind of um, remove the scaffolding such that you get to the bare essentials that enable this kind of mechanism to create the self-organizing properties that you're, you're you know you're seeking um, or not even seeking because you didn't know you were seeking. This mention of uh, structure and uh, structure that can engender self-organizing properties reminds me of the framework that you presented uh, at the end. This uh, transdisciplinary integration framework. And I, I guess I'm understanding correctly that this is something you've developed at one project with regard to your, your team's work at one project, or maybe this is just a synthesis of the entire um, uh, journey that you described for us. Is, is that right? It's the latter. It's a synthesis of the entire journey. Um, it's like, you know, from starting it's like you don't you don't really conceptualize a framework before you do it. So it's it's a little bit of like is it induction or deduction? So doing this work and then thinking about what are the what were the kinds of necessary structures or components in order for it to come to fruition, uh, in order for it to even be a possibility, and what were some of the challenges faced? You know, is there are challenges faced along the way. Um, certainly, like talking past each other was a big challenge along the way. Um, you know, some of the, when I thought about like the infrastructure piece in particular, like not having a shared vocabulary, uh, not feeling comfortable being a novice, uh, starting with people who were very, very specialized, who, who, were, who didn't want to, you know, there, there was no interest in doing this type of work. Um, I don't, I think I'm speaking to a, a, an audience that is just so deeply familiar with being embedded in between disciplines that I don't, I believe I'm preaching to the choir on that. Um, so it definitely emerged out of, uh, you know, a decade or so of working within organizations, uh, championing, championing this type of pro practice um, and um, providing avenues to demonstrate the, the impact of it as well. I think that's what's enabled it to also be translatable across organizations when I moved to a different organization, showing a track record of how it actually generated or drove impact uh, has been helpful. I could continue on this this thread. I'm just going to pause a little and see if any uh, welcome uh, others to join in. Raphael, uh, thank you very, very much. This is uh, very useful. Uh, I, I don't know if you mentioned it. I don't think you did. Uh, could you talk about your educational preparation 
what you're doing, your undergraduate studies and where you, where you got your degrees and so forth? Yeah, um, let's see. I got a, I did a double uh, undergraduate degree at Boston University in music composition and economics with a focus on computer science and kind of economic, uh, computational economics. And then I went and pursued a master's of fine arts at the California Institute of the Arts, which is a very bizarre, strange school. I almost think of it as like a kind of a boundaryless school, maybe similar to the way the Bauhaus was in the sense that there was um, really like no no discipline. So I, I, I was in a few different programs, uh, ended up getting a, an MFA in integrated media but I studied with under Tom Jennings, who created the first bulletin board system called FidoNet. Um, I worked with writer Norman Klein uh, as a critical theorist. I worked with uh, Mark Trail, who's a sound artist, uh, who worked on early synthesizers, buklas, things like that. Also worked with you know musicians like Vidal Leo Smith, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning jazz musician. Um, so it's a very hodgepodge. <laughs> Um, masters, and I also did an exchange at the California Institute of Technology. Um, so there was uh, there was an exchange program that was happening, uh, particularly because I was brought in to um, to uh, teach uh, artists computer engineering principles. Uh, so it was one of the the main rationale for for my type of skill set. Um, so uh, that was really fruitful. But I think the the bulk of my education. Um, was really after <laughs> in the sense of like developing the kind of critical and designerly approaches. Uh, design was something that I found myself uh, just just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Um, was doing a lot of creative technology work uh, in creative agencies on the East Coast and then um, fell into the space of user experience design and it was just getting formulated. And then um, happened to be mentored by some some really wonderful designers uh, early on uh, who, who showed me quite a bit. Um, so that was a variety of different things. But I think uh, being someone who's who's very fascinated with intersections, uh, which I think was also something that led me to cybernetics as being like, you know, where does someone who is interested in systems go? <laughs> um, and not knowing, not finding a place where you could actually study just systems, uh, or not many places. <laughs> so that was uh, probably just a, a variety of different things along the years. Gary? Yes, uh, thank you, Raphael, for a very fascinating uh, composition of uh, your approach to uh, uh, well, your approach to life, I guess, would be the best way to say it. Uh, you noted that you have a, a degree in composition in, this, uh, in music and that you've uh, extended to a certain extent the harmonies among a musical composition to uh, broader social and personal issues. And that sort of harmonization of the symbol systems that are involved uh, lead to your diagrams, which are very instructive and, and I think quite demonstrative of what you're trying to compose. Uh, but my question goes back to Michael's uh, response and question, uh, and that is you, you've dealt with the semantics, you've dealt with the syntax among the symbol systems, and you've dealt with the symbols themselves. What, you, what I find missing and which uh, I'm interested in is the question of the signs that are being generated by society, by other individuals in the group, etc. How do you uh, manage the signs coming to you from the external world and put them into this? And in particular, if you wanted this to, this to go to a social group, a large social group or an economic system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, this goes back to the question around the, the feedback piece of feedback being bidirectional uh, and, and operating at this this internal level. So, so for, certainly from a con collection standpoint, connective standpoint, um, I think that every every kind of ch chapter or project has fed back in and led to the creation of the next project, right? So there's a personal side of it as well. Um, 
I think from from a societal standpoint, I think it's like it's still a to be determined piece. Um, I think uh, there's a lot, you know, I'm giving this talk and talking with you guys, uh, with you all here in 2023, right? And if I were to give this talk maybe two years from now, there would be a lot more in that other piece of feedback uh, in terms of what what are the kinds of outputs. Um, so certainly as it relates to the work at One Projects and the kind of organizational or broader systems change work, um, that is just starting to kick off. The organization is just moving from, I would say, a, a research, primarily research driven, only like an understanding one way, um, one way approach, um, or not necessarily, sorry, not a one way approach, but more on a, a longer time, time trajectory, right? So it's just, we've just started that particular part of the process of collecting and gathering. And so aside from documenting and understanding and synthesizing, uh, it's now being incorporated into the kinds of work that we are looking to co-create with communities more broadly. And I see that as being reflected in the, in the work that, that I'm interested in doing moving forward is actually having things that are much more participatory and bi-directional uh, and even the construction, uh, much like we were just discussing about what is the kernel or the seed, actually thinking about uh, projects that have much more minimal scaffolding uh, that get to uh, exhibit more of these emergent effects um, that can host a plurality of different outputs that are not so predetermined uh, is really what I'm interested in moving toward. That I hope that answers your question. Well, in part, but uh, the... Uh issue that uh, a feedback, uh, let me put it in context of a feedback loop, uh, is hardly a composition in the sense that you're not involved in what's going on in the societal generation of the changes that are going on. And so that the uh, issue of how do you compose the signs coming in from the external sources, perhaps one example would be uh, a physician practicing medicine on the body, the, uh, the body itself gives a response to the therapies, and the physician then reads those signs from the patient. And this is not, not a feedback loop in the normal sense, uh, mm -hmm. but it's more in the sense Michael was talking to, uh, I think, of how, he was, how his students were aggregating their experiences. But mm -hmm. to do this on an economic system, it seemed to be quite a different problem, at least from, I, I don't know, perhaps. Perhaps that's what the stumbling block is. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think that just goes back to the notion of time and how we think about interpreting that. And that's, that's I think, what I was just getting at in the sense of, like, we haven't put anything out there into the world yet. And so it's, I don't know how the body will respond, to use your, you know, use your analogy, because it hasn't been there yet. So and that's why I was, we're still on kind of the, the first part of maybe being the doctor, seeing, like, okay, what's actually happening here? And then we haven't performed an action out yet. Uh, so I wouldn't even say that the work that I've shown you thus far is, is the action out, um, the kind of designed output. Um, so that's certainly uh, one way that I would interpret uh, what you just asked. Good luck with your work. I look forward to further progress. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. <laughs> Analogous to the doctor, this uh, conversation, Jerry, is reminding me of uh, resilience theory and resilient science and uh, adaptive you know, complexities of adaptive management and trying to understand what's going on in the ecosystem and after any particular uh, engagement. Um, uh, Brett? Yeah, so I'm curious to say, you, you said things like, um, you know, we don't really have the final output yet. I'm curious how we can follow your work and uh, yeah, basically just engage with you and your, and your work if we're interested. Yeah, um, so I'm I'm not that active on social media anymore. <laughs> Good <All> for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do, so artwork wise, the things that are not as um, one project related, I, I'm probably most active on uh, Instagram. So you'll probably see more of, of those updates. As far as one project goes, um, you should probably start seeing um, more activity uh, on the website. Uh, moving forward. So I would check the website for more. Um, so that's probably going to be the best bet. Um, 
Yeah, I think from an from an organizational standpoint, there there's a lot too. Even though the organization might not be as vocal, um, we have done a lot of uh, resourcing of really wonderful organizations in this broader ecosystem, and so certainly would love to point folks to those organizations. Uh, if they're of interest, um, and I can follow up in an email offline, or uh, if you look at some of the grantees from one project, because one project started uh, as a think tank that was also um, a partial foundation. Um, so a lot of wonderful grantees uh, that are doing really exciting work, and I, I would just want to take a moment to to ensure that I elevate those. Um, is there? Wonderful. Often, many of them are under resourced. Uh, but they're still really uh, doing impactful work in their communities. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Sebastian, I have a very quick. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this inspirational talk, Raphael. Much enjoyed it. Um, mm -hmm. I was myself a little bit confused around um, you yourself say you do alternative design, there's discursive design, there's participatory design, there's transaction design. Uh, uh, God, I, uh, uh, actually, I wrote it down. Uh, interaction design, speculative design, transition design. And I, I was just trying, I, I know you cannot give an answer now, but can you point somewhere where I can put it into something to better understand? Yeah. What is where? Yeah. Um, so I would say, I think a lot of the work, my practice, I would just equate to transdisciplinary design um, because it is uh, a merging of a lot of different disciplines. Um, there's a great Venn diagram around design practices, <laughs> which, which positions design, user experience, interaction design, speculative and critical design. It's like a bubble chart of sorts, and a lot of these are overlapping. Um, in general, I prefer to so interaction design for the really the functional core work. And then there's a broader category of discursive design, which is design intended to spark conversation. And within that, there's speculative design, there's design fiction, there are all sorts of different disciplines. Um, there's a diagram that I will dig up and will send to you. Uh, and then there's, a, there's also, um, our practices, which if you're a designer who's making discursive work, uh, there's a there's a strong uh, antagonism, uh, maybe ma antagonism may be too strong a word, um, because oh, they, the, uh, a lot of designers don't want it to be uh, positioned as something that only appears in a gallery. And so I actually feel like that is a, even a narrow interpretation of art. So there's just a lot of debate back and forth around what these terms even mean. And there are some good diagrams that try to explain this, and I'll, I'll send those over to you. We, we can that's follow that, them offline. That'd be super nice, because I, I mean, I understood that you're playing with that tension. You kind of like said, art is responsible for the questions, design is responsible for the answers. Obviously, you play with that tension. Otherwise, I would have completely misunderstood your talk. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for that. There is actually a question from Adler in the in the chat, uh, which in a way relates to, I think, also what Jerry was asking. Thank you so much again, Raphael. Much yeah, much. of course. Adler, could you uh, vote, you know speak to the question you posted? Sure. I um, I was triggered by the example you mentioned that in an exhibition you put a QR code uh, to as a way for for the participants to go beyond that exhibition and engage on the on the on the cause that is related to that. I think this is just brilliant. Uh, I mean, it's a great way to keep going, and this led me to think of. Uh, any insights, any, any, um, uh, if you could elaborate more on this sort of participation loop. So you have, you, there is a cost, like the example of the food, you know, the related to the CO2. Um, and there is a way that you might have translated this, uh, this challenge. So participants actually pay attention to that. And then once they engage, they might in the, in the end invite other friends to also participate on that problematic and like the care code and keep going. I think this, this loop understanding it would be fundamental to improve the world to address many of the challenges we have. It's not just a theory, but also how to get people in this uh, sort of engagement loop or participatory loop. So any insights, any pointers would be really interesting to hear. Um, yeah, I mean, I love how you just distilled it. Uh, I think I should be writing a paper on that as a way of thinking about a framework for <laughs> further engagement of these types of projects. Um, 
You know, it, it's funny because it's, it has evolved over the years, right? So when I started, especially with this type of work that I call art research, um, it usually begins with something in, in that is, inter, you know, has one of these interactive interaction models of interactive, responsive, or participatory. And then upon closing, I would always write a paper about this project as a way of having another point of like resources or there would be an opportunity to dig in more. And then the QR code is now just a recent evolution. Um, and certainly like exposing more of the research is something that I would like to do more of. Um, but I've even found that to be challenging. I mean, uh, this group is an exception, um, but people aren't interested. Uh, they, they don't want to delve deeper into the kind of rigorous material um, and, and read some of that. So thinking about more of these quick, lighter ways uh, and a variety of media that can be pointed to. I mean, I think having containers uh, like the QR code, which is like, you know, everyone has a phone, which is so wonderful. It's like it can point people to all sorts of different directions. So having containers like that, also even just providing like physical kiosks, right, for example, of or clipboards or certain things you know you go to a gallery space and there's a guest list for example and you can sign up right you can say i was here um but what what is that what does that actually look like to engage in this kind of work that is intended for a systems change focus um so i think for for me it, it's going to come down to imagining a variety of different outputs that can we can point people to. Uh, it's really dependent on the project itself as well. Um, but something that I, I will be thinking more about after this talk for sure. We're at uh, we're at 1030. Michael, do you want to wrap us up here? Yeah, it was more, yeah, maybe it, it more of a comment, yeah. yeah. Um, that is burning. I'm, I'm talking too much, sorry. Um, in transition design, they're all, uh, Terry Irvin and Gideon Kosov are always saying we need compelling visions of transition. And mm -hmm. we've kind of moved on from the critical design, which was so negative, yeah, to the more speculative design where you where we can make kind of choices. And my students are really tired of, as you just said earlier, yeah, of the highly theoretical speculative thing. They want compelling narratives. Yeah. And for example, they love uh, solar punk, yeah? yeah, and are reading to each other the robot and monk uh, uh, books, yeah, yeah. And I haven't yet found a way of doing this, but in the next step, it would. I, I think we would need to develop local narratives around sustainability for us that are relevant here for us, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, in in this uh, system that we already created. And this would be could be kind of speculative, but less so di the dystopian side of it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think what you're hitting on are a couple of two great things. One, transition design is a, is a wonderful school of thought. Um, and I think there's a lot of the work that I shared in the, the last chapter with one project, we think around two time horizons, one of which is being vision and the other being transition, right? Um, and so thinking about what can be done in the here and the now um, is, is especially important uh, given a community focus because it, it is empowering, right? And so I've run uh, a couple speculative workshops actually that actually take the current state of like, hey, what are we dealing with in this particular community right now? And what, what are some ideas for what we could do? You know, what are the let's list out some of the challenges or pain points and prioritize them in such a way where we can actually begin some ideation sessions around it. And there are, of course, a number of participatory design practices that we can do that try and you know, cultivate the kind of creative brainstorming around it. Um, so love those practices, uh, you know, creative ideation processes, but almost taking like a Frarian approach to design, right? In the sense of like, how are we, uh, how are we um, flattening any kind of power dynamics that are in place? And certainly thinking on a shorter term time horizon is uh, much more empowering. It might be less fun. So it's really a balance of who the audience is, you know, certain other things on the vision side that are really generative and fun that I've employed are, there are a variety of these solar punk future board games and things like that, where it's, and actually just gets people into a creative storytelling mode, which is, is very fun. Um, and so I'd encourage 
I encourage you to check those out as well. Thanks. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rafael, for, for joining us uh, today. Um, Mateus, do we do we have um, uh, some word on uh, next month's uh, speaker series? So we're still working on this, Howard, and uh, we will let you all know through Eventbrite and our members email on uh, ASC. Uh, I posted here some sites to if you if you want to give a feedback on this conversation or other speaker series events, you can do it here. We also have the link to the video, so I will post uh, this event video there also next week. Please share with it others. I think this is a great conversation and uh, it will be worth it. And Rafael, if you would like to share with me the links that you talked about with Sebastian, I will gladly share with everyone else through these links also. Yes, I will follow up with the diagrams, uh, perhaps the links to some of the solar punk futures games. Um, and just a huge thank you uh, again, Howard. Thank you, Mateus. Thank you, ASC. It's been an honor and a pleasure to chat with you today. Um, and uh, you all have my email or my website. Uh, you can find my email address on there. Um, feel free to reach out. Thank you again. Bye-bye.